Welcome to Whiskey Lore. I'm Drew Hanish. This is an episode I've been looking forward to sharing with you for quite some time. I actually went to Mount Vernon back in December and had a chance to talk to the Director of Historic Trades at George Washington's Mount Vernon Distillery and Grist Mill. And his name is Steve Bayshore. And we spent two and a half hours talking all about James Anderson and George Washington, how to recreate whiskey, how to recreate a distillery. So we're going to talk through in this first episode, and yes, there's going to be, I'm going to split this into two. You're going to hear the upstairs interview coming up this weekend. You'll hear the downstairs interview today, and Steve's going to walk me through the distillery, talk about some of the challenges of making a historic whiskey. And he'll talk us through the process, and he shows me some of the equipment that they use. He'll talk about why the distillery was put a couple miles away from the mansion. And we'll go a little bit deeper into the mindset of George Washington and James Anderson when putting the distillery together. Now, this is a working distillery, so you're going to hear water running in the background. You're going to hear workers that are stoking the flames. They're actually making brandy and finishing up a run of brandy while we're doing the interview. So you're going to hear that going on. It's definitely a working distillery and probably one of the most challenging in the world to work in because they're using these old 18th century methods and equipment. And this is a distillery that you can visit yourself, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end of the episode. But right now, let's get into the downstairs interview that I had with Steve Bayshore of George Washington's Mount Vernon Distillery and Grist Mill. Yeah, so today we're running apple brandy. Okay. So this is the last day of run, you know, we're triple distilling some brandy. Okay. Um, and then we'll barrel that soon. Uh, do, you, do you also triple distill the whiskey or? Uh, just a little bit occasionally, just for, okay. if we need to like polish up a little bit at the end. It's usually all double distilled. Okay. And we make rye whiskey, which is what Washington's men made here. So, um, and we've got five stills just as they had, and this is all based on research and archeology span that was done here. So pretty big distillery for the 18th century, you know? Mm. And the records indicate that, you know, so he, um, so we normally run this two to three or four times a year. Our main job is tours and education about the farms, those who lived and worked here, Washington's businesses, uh, the enslaved community here that worked on these sites, as well as paid staff. Mm -hmm. And um, so this reopened in 2007, so after six years of archaeology. And, and of what I'm seeing here, all of this was rebuilt in, in 2007. 2004 to 2007, okay. yeah. How did, you, how did you determine the layout? Uh, did, did you try to follow the original, and did you have original blueprints to work from, or uh, some kind of sketches or some, something to work from? No, what we had was letters between Washington and James Anderson, the farm manager, and letters between Washington and other friends describing the building was stone. 75 by 33 feet with timber frame top that he installed five stills and a copper boiler and that he had you know 50 mash tons in here for for setting fermentation that there was a fresh water well out back they dug for the water for the whiskey mm -hmm. and the positioning of this next to the grist mill is critical because you need ground gr ground grains to make the whiskey out of so all that written you know primary source documentation is there and then mount vernon's archaeological team led by Dennis Pogue at the time, and Esther White and her team excavated this for six years. Wow. Because the original burned in 1814. Okay. So for many years, this was just a field. And then when the state took it over in the 1930s, they rebuilt the grist mill, but it was a static display. You could just tour it. And it had old machinery in there, but it didn't run. Yeah. And there was a marker out here describing this was where Washington's distillery was located. And they did archaeology back then as well in the 30s. And the, the, the mill is rebuilt right over the original foundations. The distillery we're in is rebuilt right over the foundations. So the archaeology told the layout. Mm -hmm. So every still is placed where an original still was. The copper okay. boiler in the middle of the room 
is where the boiler was. Wow. Um, the cobblestone floor over there where we set mash, they found that cobblestone floor and some of those stones are original to the building. Mm. That's one thing that is original, but all the framing, everything else had to be redone. And we have craftsmen that work on special projects for Mount Vernon, uh, John O'Rourke and Gus Kiorpus, a couple other gentlemen. That, uh, John Sines was the mason that did the restoration work. So they're, they make it look real and they use the tools. So the marks on these beams are as they would have been. So when we do a reconstruction or restoration work, it's always to the highest level. And so if Washington walked in here, he would recognize this place, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and Gus Kiorpis still works on it for me, so I have money in my budget because he's a millwright yeah. that works on the mill machinery and the water wheel. So every winter this site gets work. And so the mill runs 10 months a year. This is probably the mill in America, the historic mill runs the most of any mill I know of because we grind almost every day, April through October. Mm. And we grind for whiskey and we do production grinding for food grade product. So this site's really reflective of the stories we can tell, but it's also a production site that really produces product in the mill and also spirits here out of the distillery. In the distilleries that I've been to, which are definitely much more modern, um, you are looking at hammer mills, roller mills to mill your grain. Mm -hmm. How is it being done here? It's on millstones. Okay. Yeah, so we have a 16 foot wheel in that building, wooden water wheel made of white oak driving period accurate wooden gears that drive set, sets of millstones. So the right side, which are domestic granite stones, that's where we grind rye, corn, and malted barley. And then the other set of stones are French. They're called French burr stones. And that was the premium millstone in the world for making fine flour. Mm. So Washington had a set of French burrs. Most merchant mills in America, if they could afford them, would buy French burr stones for making the high-end flour. So that's how our you know, runs start in the mill. And that's what's neat here is these two buildings reflect that time period that goes back generations. You know, you go back in Ireland, Scotland, anywhere where spirits, grain spirits were made, you have to have the mill. Yeah. And in those days, prior to the roller mill, which came along in 1840s, um, it was all stone ground. And in fact, in Ireland, there's listings of mills. I have a mill on Irish, a book on Irish mill history. And a lot of them, they list what they did. It says malt. So some mills were set up specifically just to feed that other industry of distilling or brewing. Yeah. And so in this case, Washington already had the mill. So when he, when, you know, to go back to this story, when he hires James Anderson, the farm manager, uh, Anderson was from Inverkeething, Scotland. He had been involved in farming, milling, distilling, and shipping spirits down to England, where they would redistill it into gin oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And so he knew the business top to bottom, left to right. He was re really well versed in it. So when he applies for the job, as Washington's looking for a new farm manager, because keep in mind, this was an 8,000 acre farm at its peak. Yeah. Actually four farms and five if you count Mansion House, which Washington sometimes refers to as the home house farm, which was smaller, but he still grew grains there. You know, not, he had the pleasure garden, all the upper gardens, but part of that was growing crops. But we're, at, we're three miles from the mansion right now. So we're on part of Doe Run Farm, which was, uh, you know, one of the four agricultural sites. And, they, and really this farm was the industrial farm for Mount Vernon mm -hmm. because there had always been a mill here. The Washingtons owned a mill that they purchased from another landowner as they enlarged the original Mount Vernon track. And it was on the same creek, but about a third of the mile up that direction north. And that was a country mill, which just fed the plantation ground, you know, some toll milling for locals. Mm -hmm. Washington ends up building a bigger merchant mill in 1770. So when Anderson writes Washington, he actually says, I've been on your farm. So he's uh, really pitching himself to get this job. Yeah. And he says, you know, so I think in his mind, even before he told Washington of his idea for the distillery, I think it's all kind stewing in his mind. So he moved here in 1790, 1791, 91, somewhere in that yeah. um, And he actually was working nearby, but not working here, from what I understand. Well, he first lived in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Okay. So he worked for another landowner. He actually built another distillery there. Yeah. Uh, but he writes to Washington that the landowner didn't have enough property to really faithfully feed that the grain it needed. Mm -hmm. And so it makes me think that Anderson liked to go big, it seemed, because that was probably a bigger than that local landowner could feed, because this will eat a lot of grain with five stills. So, so he, he pitches himself in that way, explains some of that. And the first letter related to him 
trying to get the job, he doesn't give enough detail. So Washington writes him and basically asks what we would ask for is a resume. Mm -hmm. And that's where Anderson gets more detailed. And he, it, the phrase I always remember from that letter, he said, I ran mills, plural, that fed distilleries, plural. Uh, okay. So he's in pretty deep. Yeah. And, uh, and again, the merchant trade too, and shipping and stuff. So, so with that information, Washington knows he's probably the man for the job. And he hires him January 1797. And Washington's coming back home from the presidency within weeks. And Anderson writes him, and one of the things he says is, you need a distillery. Uh, it'll complete your farm business plan. You know, I know how to do this. I've done this. And that's how the story starts. So Washington also got into crop rotation. I don't think he initially was doing that with when he was farming tobacco. Well, that happens in the 1760s. Okay. So as he's leaving tobacco uh, because of soil exhaustion, and the soil up here in this part of northern Virginia is a lot of clay. So it's not the best tobacco soil to be in mm. with. So what happens is he can see that if he stays with tobacco because of some bad crop fields, 1764, 65, and the fact that the British controlled the trade, you had to ship it overseas. There's a lot of middlemen cuts that happen. So as part of part of that control of the crown, plus his fact his land's just not able to do it anymore. Right. That that's made led the switch to grain, which also at that time he's reading all the books on the new husbandry crop rotation. You know, what we would call more scientific farming is starting to be thought of. And that's when he does write, writes out some of these crop rotation plans and fertilization of various types to bring the land some life back to it. Yeah. And so that led him down the path of grain, which leads to the building of the merchant mill to export flour. So he was very forward thinking and all that and implemented it pretty early for someone in Virginia being a Virginia planter. Because back then, if you grew tobacco, you referred to as a planter. Mm -hmm. He becomes what we call a farmer because he's moving into grains and other crops. Yeah. And a lot of Virginians stayed in tobacco a long, much longer. And, it, you know, when you, the upheaval of the late 1700s with the American Revolution, the French Revolution, impacted a lot of markets for tobacco. And Washington was proved to be pretty smart to get out early. So, not knowing a lot about uh, uh, crop rotations and how that works, uh, but understanding the, the basic concept of it, rye was one of the grains that they would use to do this rotation that was in, yeah. in this particular area. Yeah. But was rye used for anything or was it just there to sort of replenish the soil? It's a little bit of both. I've found references of it being, you know, milled. Uh, and then sometimes it's just a cover crop. Okay. Yeah. So I, and it, it, so it's, it's a little bit of both going on. Could and it have been James Anderson seeing that rye not being utilized that set the bell off in his head that said, hey, this might be a good you know, uh, well, farm for distilling. Having been in America for eight years, he would have already seen rye whiskey being pretty prevalent yeah. you know, in Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia. And so um, I think he was aware of markets. And so that's what people were drinking. I mean, corn whiskey existed. Bourbon, as we talked about upstairs, doesn't yet exist as a named right. specific type whiskey, but there's no doubt that all those were in the market. A lot of brandy was in the market. Um, and so I think Anderson being a businessman, a farmer, and a distiller would have been aware of what's being consumed. And I think the majority of it was rye in this region. It's, it's interesting because I wonder about these, when I first heard about James Anderson and that he came from Scotland, and we think about Scotland nowadays as being single malt whiskey as the most, you know, is, is popular, it's come back, but blended whiskeys were always uh, trying to compete with the Irish. So he was familiar with malt. milling other types of grains beyond malt, maybe not specifically corn because that wasn't as prevalent in, in Scotland. But, uh, but that thought of a Scottish distiller Although he wasn't a distiller at the time, so this is all stuff that I'm learning as, as, as we go. Uh, but he had knowledge of what they were using in distilling. It's just interesting to think, you know, that shift in mentality to doing mash bills here versus making grain whiskey and, and making malt whiskey. And, and how he would have developed his skill as a, as a distiller once he got here with that new mentality. And why wouldn't just go to malt? 
Well, because I think it's all about markets. You know, he had to convince Washington what would sell and, you know, tastes that human beings have. You know, you can look at trends in alcohol over time and, you know, the 70s where brown liquors were just really down. And so I think it's, he comes to a new country. He's a smart man. Uh, he would have probably been doing corn and rye down there in Fredericksburg at that earlier distillery. So he's got to make something that's going to be a saleable product or right. your boss is not going to be happy. It's not going to be an ongoing concern that makes money. So, and, you know, and I think he just switched to what was in the new country he was in. He said, I got to make rye because I'm not going to, you know, market malt whiskey to Americans at that time. There's no way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think he just adapted. He adapted. And he would have understood fermentation and all that. I, there's no doubt if he was involved at that level in Scotland, he would have been in many distilleries and, and understood the process. And his son, you know, obviously at some point got training as a distiller or he wouldn't have been able to do it here. Yeah. Yeah, talk a little bit about his son. Um, how early did he get involved here, do you know? Pretty early. Did Pretty he? early, yeah. So I think John is his name, John Anderson, and he's in his early 20s when his dad gets this position. So as the distillery ideas floated to Washington, the first distillation done here is done in the cooperage next to the mill. Mm. Uh, so we don't have that reconstructed, but they had, Washington had built a cooperage by the mill in 1770 because he needed his coopers to make barrels. And many of those coopers were enslaved men. Mm. And the head miller was also tasked in his contract when he's not milling to be making barrels too. So he had a man who was very skilled that made barrels as well. And they're exporting lots of flour, so that was a necessity. But the coopers here move around wherever they're needed because Washington had a commercial fishing operation and a lot of barrels are needed for that. But that was the, the vessel to carry all sorts of things. Washington hears Anderson out about, let's get into distilling. And being frugal, Washington says, I agree. It's a business I'm not familiar with, but you can do that in the cooperage. So instead of launching a new building, yeah. it's kind of a, let's see what this man can do. Okay. Let's see. So they set up two stills, and we know from our records that James Anderson's son, John, and an enslaved man worked in there with two stills in 1797 and produced 600 gallons of whiskey. Okay. And they did not barrel age whiskey then. Yeah. So it went right into market as a white dog, an unaged rye, and that meant profits coming right back. And on that basis, Washington sees, okay, Definitely the market's here, the money's coming in, it's a quick turnaround. So that loosens up his thought process about going bigger. And then that later that year, Washington agrees to start a dedicated new building. Mm. So prior to that though, one last thing Washington does is he writes Colonel John Fitzgerald, who had been in the military with Washington and had at one time owned a rum distillery in Alexandria, and he was a merchant. And he wrote and asked, you know, what do you uh, think of this proposal? And he came back that, well, Anderson has a good reputation and there's a lot of money to be made in it. And in fact, he says, if you make good whiskey, you'll sell. Mm. So with that advice, Washington then agrees. And you can see the, the letters, I, I agree to you commencing an distillery. And they had to outfit it then. So Washington hired a stonemason. He also had enslaved men that were carpenters and masons that worked on this. He takes the two stills out of the cooperage and he buys three more okay. from a coppersmith in Alexandria named George McNunn. He buys a 210 gallon copper boiler which you're gonna need to heat that water to cook and ferment. All that gets built up over the winter of 1797-98. By March of 98, it's up and running with five stills, which you know we've replicated here. And so really the way I describe it is you've got a two still operation which we call farm distilling. And now we're really commercial with this many stills. Yeah, yeah. And so, were there any records on those original two pot stills to kind of get a, or little drawings or something to show what they, they looked like? Not drawings, but there's, there's a little bit of a knowledge on it I've come across in research and a little few gray areas. Because in 1759 and 1760, Washington buys a couple of pot stills. Like any farmer, it's nice to have a still around for various reasons. And so I did find a reference about one of those stills when they're in the cooperage working. Mm -hmm. And Washington, the letter from Anderson's missing, but the reply from Washington exists. And he says, I'm glad to hear of the old still doing so well. Ah, okay. So that means I think one of those early purchases ends up being one of the stills that's in there. Okay. And then I think that there's, there's 
a fair good possibility that he does not migrate both of those stills over here because of the gallon size of them. Okay. I know what the gallon capacity was here, yeah. and those were a little smaller. So again, I think maybe one of them came, but not both. It makes you wonder if they were aware at that time of how the size of a, of a still or the shape of a still could create consistency or inconsistency issues. Depending oh, they, on they were aware. And I think they? Anderson, he relied on Anderson for all of that. So I think they were very much aware of, of still shapes and sizes, which goes back you know, into the 1300s and 1400s for different types of distillations. You can see drawings of the way they design the head or the body of the still, depending on what they're doing yeah. or how much, you know, in some cases, reflux you may want on the still. So I think there was a lot more knowledge back then and um, then we would maybe assume that they had. They, I think they're, they're pretty smart about that sort of stuff. Yeah, and it's funny because we think about the large lowland distilleries that he was probably shipping grain to, James Anderson, and you get a picture in your mind of what today's modern distilleries look like. But a large distillery back then wasn't using a coffee column still or uh, you know anything that was going to be huge. You could do it in smaller buildings like mm -hmm. this. So it'd be interesting to know, you know, what what a large scale distillery in Scotland at that time would, would have look like. Looked like. And size why on, po yeah. on pots. Yeah. Yeah, because I do know in this country that rum distilleries, the stills for rum distilleries were massive. Mm -hmm. Five thousand gallon still, eight thousand gallon still compared wow. to whiskey. Okay. So you're looking at, you know, Washington had a couple stills that were in the range of 130 gallons and then 110 gallons still and a, two more that were just slightly smaller. Yeah. And I think, you know, we could talk about the output here and I, I have some theories about how they made that much in that year. But because uh, how much of uh, if you were running this at full capacity, uh, you know, just seven days a week, but maybe not, you know, maybe 12 hours a day or 10 hours a day. What do you think you probably would be able to produce off of these? In a year, I bet we could get, we could get five to 7,000 gal okay. gallons in a year, but we'd be killing ourselves to do it the way we do it. Yeah. And that's the other aspect about having done this now over a decade is that you realize how hard whiskey production was and the methods they had in that time period. You know, because we hand row mash mm -hmm. and we bucket water. And, you know, they did have a couple pumps in here made of 10 TIN yeah. for moving spirit or moving water. So we know they had some implements to do that, but there's a lot of manual labor. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in here are eight men, you know, six enslaved men and James Anderson's son, John. And over the time of two, three years, there's a couple different, you know, assistant distillers. One we always talk about was a guy named Peter Bingle. Um, and there were a couple others that rotated through. So in 1799, on this spot we're standing, they made 10,942 gallons of rye whiskey wow. in one calendar year. Were they also making brandy in here as Small well? Small amounts, yeah. Okay. A few hundred gallons a year. He sold a little of it, but it seems like a lot of that ends up in barrels in the mansion, and that's entertaining, oh, okay. and you know, he had a lot of guests. And yeah. so, But a little bit of profit out of brandy, but the, the main profit was the whiskey, the rye whiskey. So you can hear the water running, that's the cooling water uh -huh. uh, coming down from the mill race to cool the coils on the stills. Hope that's not bleeding too much over on your mic. No, I think we'll be, I think we'll be fine. Yeah, as long as, uh, but that's so people know what that sound is. So basically the, wa the water infrastructure here is why, and the grain is why the distillery had to be here because Washington's mill existing since 1770, two miles up on the farm at a higher elevation. They had a mill dam and a pond, the reservoir of water for the mill. Mm -hmm. Real long mill race brought water down through the farm to run the water wheel. And then, and it's interesting because Washington initially, when Anderson proposes it, he says, well, can't we build the distillery down by your house, which is on the other end of Mount Vernon on the river, the Potomac yeah. River. And, and Washington knows this, but he's worried about theft. He's worried about what will happen if I build a still house here because uh, there could be problems. You know, he was concerned about his property. And Anderson says, well, we need the mill. And Washington knows, yeah, we need, I know that. You yeah, know, yeah. you gotta have the mill and the water. So they, they built a wooden trough that brings water from the mill race down along the side, outside the distillery and elbows in 
and follows the, the wall there. And then we have spouts feeding down to the worm tubs that cool the coils wow. and the stills. Okay. And then there's floor drains, which were found archeologically. And we've got a drain system under the floor as they did, but it's a little more modern under the floor that takes the water back away to the creek. Okay. So, um, you know, without being a miller, I'm always partial to the mill. So I always say, you know, that can stand alone to make money. The distillery makes a lot more money, yeah. but it needs that mill. Yeah. It needs that mill. So, um, and so the two big stills here, and then the, these are a little smaller down there, but again, laid out just as the archaeology remains showed us. And then maybe we should walk over to the mash floor. You want to? Yeah, yeah. Take so take me through your process, and let's let's talk a little bit about how you're producing versus how Washington. Uh, its time period would have, have produced whiskey. Yeah, so on the cobblestone mash floor we're standing and we've got a 210 gallon copper boiler here and this um, was a wood-fired boiler back in the day and so they would stoke that fire and the water was from the freshwater well out back okay. because the creek here if you've seen the creek, it's not the nicest water to make anything out of. It's really used just for running the water wheel and cooling water for the stills, coils. So once this is boiling hot, the men working in here are going to bucket. There's a side valve, but also these ladles. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're going to bucket in hot water to one of these 120-gallon mash tons, and or sometimes called hogsheads. But, um, and we know the dimension from the record, so that you know, it's a big white oak barrel. And then you're gonna bucket in that hot water. And as that's being added, the corn and rye are added first. So ground corn meal, ground rye. And this was a rye whiskey of around 55 to 60% rye component, 30 to 35% corn, and the rest was malted barley. So as the corn and rye are going in with the water, we use mash rakes. You can see those wooden rakes over there. And we row that mash by hand to mix the grain thoroughly. So by the time you've got all that mixed in, in the first you know, 20 minutes of the set, that water level's near the top, put a lid on it to trap heat to let it cook. Okay. And it'll cook for a period of 45 minutes to maybe an hour and 15 minutes. So you're, I mean, you're getting it hot over here, you're putting it into your mash tun, and then it's basically just cooling, cooling down, but it's cooking mm -hmm. as, as the temperature slowly starts to drop. And you want to move quick because we want to cook at a certain temperature. So yeah. that's the dilemma here in our, our process. And this is, what's neat about it is that it, it causes um, limitations and hold heat real high. We can't dial it in, but I think it leads to part of the unique way of the whiskey taste. This is how they did it. We're doing it the way they did it. And there's nothing we can do about certain limitations we have here. We're not, you know, we have certain aspects we, we've ramped up a little for bottling and filtering, but 90% of it on the front end is really done like they did it back then. Okay. So you lose heat, you know, you even lose heat as you're bucketing because water's, you know, if you're doing the front row of fermenters, mm -hmm. that's an easy pour. But we'll have three rows of these by day three. So when you have to carry water out to row three, yeah. you know, it's traveling along in the open air and losing heat. So we get that lid on it as quickly as possible. So when you're setting the first two grains, you want to work as fast as possible. Get them in, get it covered, and let it cook. And then when it's uh, in the high 140s, we'll hit it with malted barley. Okay. And the malt will then take effect, and this gelatinous rye can be very sticky and gelatinous. It'll start to thin out, and also that conversion of starch to sugar starts happening. So, so talk a little bit about malted barley, because, again, it probably to the uh, person familiar with how bourbon is made. Uh, we don't pay as much attention to malted barley over here, but over in Scotland, of course, you know, if you're malting barley, they used to have big malting floors within the distilleries that they would do all of their in-house malting. Would there have been a malting floor or somewhere where they, and were they getting the barley from Washington's farms? He's getting, um most of the grain for this building from his farms, but it, it, to make that much whiskey with five stills, he couldn't grow enough. Mm -hmm. Also, the corn that's a component of the mash bill, that was also rations for the enslaved population, the paid staff, the Washington family. So he couldn't pull all the corn mm -hmm. from his farm and run it through the distillery. So he has to contract to buy corn from a relative. And he got so many barrels a year just for the distillery. Um, he also has to buy rye sometimes. And okay. found out recently 
that he was buying some rye grain right across the river in Maryland. Ah, okay. It's kind of interesting. So there's, you know, there's a lot of trade along the river. Yeah. And so he, he grew rye, but he had to buy some. He had grew corn, had to buy some. The barley he grows. And he did build a malt house on site. So I think it was outside in that direction near the building. And we have a description of its construction. Yeah. So uh, I also wonder sometimes if he wasn't malting the rye as well. Okay. Uh, that's just a mystery. But yeah. I have some, you know, it's gut feeling that that was probably going on. Well, it's interesting to see. There are some distillers that have gone to using malted rye mm -hmm. and skipping barley mm -hmm. altogether. Yeah, there's some that are 100% rye that are, are very high rye that are all, you know, they malt that. So malt, rye, from what I, little I know about its malting, it does take well to that. Yeah. And it'll change the flavor profile. So one of the, I actually watched a video that was showing that process of adding the barley. I had never seen it go from this thick, because when they're stirring this initially, when it's, it's corn, it's like oatmeal, mm -hmm. the corn and rye and can be very hard to stir but in adding the malted barley in the the character of it changes completely yeah and again i i'm no uh, i'm a historian by trade so i'm not a, i'm not a chemical engineer or a chemist but what i do have learned from our consultants is there's liquefaction that takes that thick grain and you know gives it a smoother easier to roll liquefying and sacrification which is a sugar creation that starts so malt's critical yeah and then we'll let that cover that, let it rest for a period of time, and then row it down to temperature to yeast. So all those grains go in in the first day, the yeast will be hit in the early evening before we leave. Washington got yeast from a brewery in Alexandria okay, and would be able to cultivate it, but I recently found that he made two or three other purchases over the years, or Anderson did, when they needed yeast, they go to that brewer. Uh, okay. And then it'll ferment three to five days. Here, what we've learned over the years is we'll ferment three days usually, and it's consumed most of those sugars. Occasionally because of weather, you know, this building, you can feel it, it's cold in here today. It's, um, it's not like a modern place. Even though many distilleries I do know, they're, not all of them are uh, climate controlled. I have a few distiller friends and they work in cold environments sometimes too. Yeah. But the walls here are two and a half feet thick and whatever the temperature outside is even with fires running it's cold in here and that'll affect how long it ferments sometimes even when it's hot and humid outside you still have a, a certain amount of uh, it's it doesn't get over 90 plus degrees in here where it does start, so whatever does, the outside weather is yeah. like when the seasons change once it penetrates the mill or distillery that's what it's like inside too okay and so like the grist mill you know in the winter is an iceberg you can see your breath <laughs> um, that's why we run the mill like they would have as long as they could then you get ice on the wheel you stop for the winter yeah or the creek would freeze back in his day so we've been in here in like May when we were making brandy once and it was real mild spring and then the last three days the temperature shot up to 90. We were, we were roasting in here, especially wow. with fires running. So, But that, all the elements affect the outcome. So what do you do with the uh, fermentation process then? Do you just not ferment in the summer? You're not yeah. running the stills in the summer? No, we okay. can't. Yeah. And I, I, have, I don't think they did a lot of that either. It's okay. The fermentation is affected by it. You don't have cool water from the mill race. Virginia in summers, in his day, there were a lot of droughts. So sometimes the mill can't even run, so you couldn't produce. And then when the cooler months start coming on, they ramp back up. Okay. So after it ferments three to four days, we then do another bucket brigade and we bucket mash to the stills. So the heads of the stills can come off, as you can see, to their, the, the onions, as they're called, are popped off. And you can pour right in through the throat of the pot and fill the still. That's interesting. I love this bucket brigade idea that you basically, so it's all hands on deck for, uh, for a few minutes while we go run all this stuff over to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to the next phase. And so you're stilling uh, with the grain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We tried early on to lauder it and, uh, you know, cheesecloth and stuff. It just was, took so much time and it wasn't really working. And so we go, it, it, it's not like it's chunky. You know, the thing yeah. you have to do at the end of the day is drain the slop out of the still. You, if you leave it in there overnight, we learned the hard way, it'll bake on like cornbread. You'll have a hell of a job scraping that out. Well, that's where I also hear sometimes moonshiners will talk, in the, talk about scorching their whiskey because you have more of a chance that you could actually burn that 
grain at the bottom yeah, of you your can. still. Yeah, yeah. So that's a. So how do you manage that? You well, just try to temperature control, or no? What we do, it's uh, what we've learned to do is we will set the fire after the stills are all charged. We don't put the onion on right away. We have a paddle and we'll row as the fire is being built up. We'll do that walking down the line, rowing each one. So you're stirring the bottom. And then once it starts to see signs of getting close to boiling, you know, we'll put the head on and connect okay. all the line arm and the, and the coil, and then you're off and running. Yeah. And it's interesting, we have a couple of texts we've acquired through different libraries that have been republished of 18th century um, stills and how to operate distilleries. And they talk about doing that. We were already doing it. They talk about rowing it. Don't put the head on right away. Yeah. And they refer to when you see it start to boil inside, then put the head on. We, we do it a little earlier. We'll see a wisp of vapor and we'll go ahead and put it on there. A lot of trial by error, I guess, in your, uh, in your initial runs. Yeah, we've learned a lot over the years and it was certainly mistakes were made <laughs> and corrections were made. <laughs> Yeah, and well, lessons were learned. I was going to say the uh, the plus to making mistakes on smaller batches like this is that you ruin a batch of this size. It's not catastrophic. Whereas yeah. if you were running a continuous still and you were you know pumping out hundreds of thousands of gallons and then find out that's that a painful oops, mistake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, not too long ago, I saw my first pot still that was gas fired mm -hmm. and had the flames going underneath it. And that is so rare nowadays, and you're actually kindling fire. Yeah, wood fire. Yours. Yeah, and you can see here on this one. Wow. And again, we're just running one today just because we're down to the end of the run, but for the last couple of weeks, we've been running these three small stills on this brandy run. So what is the main difference? I, I hear brandy is a little bit more messy to work with when you are at the beginning stages, I guess. Or yeah, if you had to press like the apple juice or with peaches, you know, get pit them and press the juice. There's a, they would have had cider presses in the 18th century to do that. So are and, you doing it more from already uh, created wine? And no, it's from juice, but we have okay. a couple partners, uh, one that runs a cider operation, and so he has an orchard of over 4,000 trees. Oh, wow. And so we're able to get him to press it for us, which is great. Um, and he has varietals of trees that Washington would have grown. Yeah. So we try, you know, it's not all uh, early varietals, but they're mixed in there with the juice. So we've got that angle. We're trying to, you know, build the history into it. Are there any differences in terms of the actual distillation process? You say you triple distill. Just, the, a, the just a little bit. It, yeah, yeah. It, not with every run. That's kind of based on flavors and where we are with what we last have. And if we think we can get a few more gallons out and polish it up more, we'll run a little batch at the end and triple it. The difference is, is and again, others can speak more to the science of it better than me, but what I've learned is you want, you want some more tails in your brandy at the lower end of the run because there's flavor notes in there. So basically what we've learned to do is we'll do the first pass, first distillation, and we'll mingle all that together, basically rebuilding the apple. Mm. You know, we take a heads cut, so we always remove that, but then you have the hearts and some of the tails at a certain level, and that goes back, and we build that back, and then we double it. Okay. In but, other words, you want a little bit more of the fruity funk that probably comes from that, that tail, but in whiskey, it doesn't really yeah. give you quite the... Yeah, well you want, flavorful advantage. Yeah, you want some of that in there, but there's a point with whiskey when you know it's like, you know, pouring bad into good. You want you cut the still off when it's when it's uh, hitting that level and that gets destroyed. Yeah, yeah. So you're busy stoking these fires uh, throughout the day, then I guess to keep them rolling. Yeah, the the double runs will, like yesterday and the day before the still ran for from nine in the morning till about. 6.30 at night. Oh, wow. The whiskey, it'll run about four or five hours, but the double runs are always longer, the finish runs, just because you've got distillate that goes in that is a certain proof, and it's going to come off at a high proof. So the brandy's been coming off around 150, mm -hmm. and it'll ride high for several hours, and then, you know, as it goes through the day, those proofs drop down into the tails, and then at some point, we're ready to cut it off. And the brandy runs for us are easier, too, in that it's a smaller run. You know, with whiskey, we'll set the most we've ever set on fermentations 
is 54 of these barrels. Uh -huh. So that's a lot of mash. That's wow. over 10,000 pounds of grain. Yeah. With the, the juice here we get, it, um, you know, it's going to be a lot smaller volume, so it makes everything easier with two or three stills instead of all five. Well, I was going to say, th then you are, with the whiskey, you're actually running all five stills at the same time yeah. for production. And how long does your production run usually go for that much? Whiskey? About 30 days. Is it? 30 days straight every okay. day. Yeah. And you do that in the spring or the fall? Or we do it in fall? March usually, right before we open. April 1 is when the tours start. Yeah. And then we'll get into our tour season, regular, you know, educational programs. And then we'll run whiskey again in November. Well, after the tours end, because yep. you're in five stills, there's some safety issues and things to so get tour groups in here. Right. We've run whiskey in October before, small batch, you know, so we've done it in season. Yeah. On occasion and brandy on, on occasion. Um, but when you're running all five and you got that much grain and fermentation going on, you know, we'll do small VIP package tours sometimes for just a group of 10, which they pay an extra fee. They get a tasting. They get to come in and see it operating. But for the general tours, it would just be too many people. And now... The year of 2020, you know, it's one of the reasons we're doing brandy is it's less staff in here. Uh, you know, we'd normally this time of year, we'd be running rye. Right, yeah. But uh, I think I can smell this coming on. It's starting to smell. You can smell it. So it's going to come online in a little bit, and then we'll do our heads cut, and we'll run this until we think it's... Uh, hit that mark where we you know we're, we're dropping out of the good flavor and the... And this will be the last run of this particular batch. And so Steve and I continued our conversation downstairs, talking a little bit more about where he makes his cuts, where he gets his barrels and his mash tubs. And Steve also threw out some of the all-star names that came in from Kentucky, Scotland, and beyond to help get the distillery set up. And if you are a member of the Whiskey Lore Society, you're going to get a chance to hear the second half of that downstairs distillery walkthrough. And... All you have to do is go to patreon.com slash whiskey lore. Here's a little sample of what you'll hear. Do an experiment because you weren't really distilling prior to coming here. Correct? No, no, I was a miller and traditional miller. And so I came with my mind really focused on the water mill. And over time, you know, the depth of the project here, I've gotten more and more love for making spirits. And so I came here in January of 07. And this restoration was just being finished. The stairs here didn't exist yet. They hadn't finished oh, yet. Wow. And then we shot a History Channel film where we did some, you know, water in the still, running them. It's pretty neat just to show, you know, tell a story. Yeah. And then March of that year before we opened, we had a, several major master distillers come here with Dave Pickerell and Jimmy Russell and Chris Morris from Woodford and others. And we made one small run and barreled it. Yeah. And that's when you, you know, in my mind, you know, as a traditional miller, I started to see another side of grain. And then it's just grown from there. So I've been very lucky to be here at this time. And Dave came in 09 and helped us do our first batches. And then occasionally we do something special with, you know, the Distilled Spirits Council. We bring press here or other distillers here because the Distilled Spirits Council funded this restoration. Mm. And so a lot of the major companies contributed to get this rebuilt. And so yep. then we do these projects and you learn from each person that comes through here. And I think, you know, the last five years, the program's really grown. And I think we're just in a neat spot right now to where we have some really great whiskey we've released. We've got a lot more skills. We understand more. We've still got a lot to learn, but we have a lot of barrels laid down that's just really fine product. And, you know, um, I look forward to seeing how that comes out in the bottle when we get the yeah. bottle all that. So if you want to hear more of that interview, just head out to patreon.com slash whiskey lore. And if you're not a member, well, you can hear the interview and help support this independent podcast by joining for as little as $5 per month. And coming up this weekend, I'm going to share my upstairs interview with Steve as we dive a little deeper into the story of James Anderson and the George Washington Distillery. If you want to visit the distillery, they'll be opened up in April again at a cost of $10. All you have to do is go to mountvernon.org. You can find out all the information. They even have a virtual tour out there so you can see some of the stuff that I was looking at while doing this interview. The Whiskey Lore is a production of Travel Fuels Life, LLC. And for show notes, head to whiskey-lore.com slash episodes. I'm your host, Drew Hanish. 
And until next time, cheers and slonjava.